Well, when I was a, a new pastor, young and fresh out of seminary, I went to the hospital to meet a young couple who had had their first child. Exciting times. There was a lot of family around, and I walked into a room, and it was a full room. I just happened to show up when everyone else was already there. I, I didn't know any of them other than the couple. Now, I hadn't yet found my pastoral sea legs, so to say, and I didn't understand that as a young pastor, uh, you know, sometimes as a pastor, but let alone a young pastor, uh, sometimes you know, people will treat you a little bit differently, or they can put additional weight on your words. Uh, when I arrived and I was introduced to the room full of people, some of the family looked at me as though I was going to usher in doves from heaven upon this child. I, I wasn't. Um, others sort of looked at me or greeted me awkwardly because they weren't sure, you know, what do I do with this pastor guy? I remember there was an older gentleman, I, th I think he was the grandfather in the room, uh, offered me a cigar to which he was scolded by his wife. You're not allowed to smoke in a hospital, she said. After, uh, after spending some time with the family and seeing the child, I led the family in a, in a prayer of just thanking God for life and the joy that it brings. Upon finishing my prayer, one very, very excited, newly minted, first-time grandmother in the room said, Oh, thank you, Pastor. That was a beautiful prayer. And then looking at the baby, with just gushing with love. It just was coming out of her. She put her hand on my arm, and she looked, she looked at the little child. She said, Isn't this a miracle? To which I, in my fresh out of seminary state of mind, said, well, no, actually, it's not a miracle. To which the room went silent, and all eyes focused on us, as Nona looked at me with an expression of absolute horror and gasped, how can you say such a thing? Now, while I was fresh out of seminary, I wasn't that green that I couldn't read a room and I knew that it was time to backpedal and fast. Now wasn't the time to be bringing alignment to a misaligned theological statement. Now, I, don't, I can't remember exactly what it was I said that got me out of that jam, but uh, we all parted with a laugh, and, and Nona hugged me as I left, and I learned my lesson that telling any grandmother that her first grandchild was not a miracle, as true as that statement might be, was not a thing to do again. Now, I think we can all agree what, uh, what Nona was intending to convey in saying that her grandchild was a miracle was her amazement and her joy. A new baby, one that she just instinctively loved and cherished had come into the world. But that said, sometimes in a circumstance where we, we have wonder and awe and it overtakes us, in a literal sense, we can misuse the word miracle. A miracle is, by definition, that which defies the laws of nature and demands that a working of a supernatural source is taking place. And while we here know enough about the birds and the bees to explain how a baby is made, to know that the regular reproductive process, while amazing, is not a miracle, but just how the way God has designed things to work, what we have in the Christmas story is. You see, when a virgin becomes pregnant, either she wasn't really a virgin or a miracle has taken place. And when it comes to the Christmas story, the miracle is clearly stated, but in the minds of most carol singers today, it can often be lost or understated if it's even believed at all. Around this time of year in our house, we often have Christmas music playing. It might be the same for you in your house. And it's not uncommon for musicians from all different walks of life to uh, sing their rendition of well-known Christmas carols. Now, if you were to examine the, the words of any older carol, you will quickly see that they are theologically dense. In the carol, the work of the triune God is being declared in majesty without apology or restriction. One time as we were listening to these songs, uh, one of my kids heard one of these ancient carols uh, being sung and excitedly said, Hey, Dad, I didn't know pentatonics we're Christians? To which uh, my wife and I looked at each other and then informed our, our child that we didn't believe that they were. Uh, to which my astute child stated, then why are they singing songs about Jesus? It doesn't seem to make any sense to sing something you don't really believe. Well said. 
there are a few doctrines, those things about God, which if you remove them, you no longer have the gospel. You no longer have the good news about Jesus saving life, his substitutionary death, and triumphant resurrection for all who place their faith in him. Now, there are some things that, as Christians, we can disagree on and still be Christians, like whether or not infants should be baptized, whether or not women should be elders, whether or not the gift of tongues is for today, or the timing and the circumstance surrounding the return of Christ are just a few of those things. But the virgin birth offers us no such opportunity for disagreement, let alone denial. And you may not have thought of this before, but the virgin birth is one doctrine, one belief that is core to the Christian gospel. You may not have thought of this before, but if you are a Christian, believing in the virgin birth is actually core to your Christian faith. You see, without it, not only do you not have Christmas, but you also don't have a Christ who can save. In our time together this morning, we're going to unpack a truth that has always been held by the church, capital C, that isn't just core to Christmas, but core to being Christian. To do this, we're going to look back to a passage that we've uh, looked at before, so we're familiar with it, and it's found in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38, so I'd invite you to open your Bibles there. In our time together, in, intertwine, in an intertwined kind of way to answer, we're going to be answering the following two questions. Why is the virgin birth central to the Christian faith? And two, what are some ways that well-intentioned people over the years have got it wrong? And in answering these two questions, my hope is that we will leave having been encouraged that we have placed our faith in a Christ who is sufficient to save Remember, Luke's gospel is one that's intended to give us confidence in the things that we have believed to be true about Jesus. And in Luke's gospel, we are given information about Jesus that isn't intended to simply bring about a sense of wonder and awe like a grandmother has over her first grandchild, but inform us why it is that Jesus is the only one sufficient to save our soul. That said, if you're able, I'd invite you to stand with me for the reading of God's word in Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 26. Listen as I read God's word for us this morning. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. But she was deeply troubled by this statement, wondering what kind of greeting this could be. Then the angel told her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary asked the angel, How can this be? since I have not had sexual relations with a man. The angel replied to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And consider your relative Elizabeth, even though she has conceived a son in her old age. Even she has conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month for her, her who is called childless. For nothing will be impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, said Mary. May it be done to me according to your word. Then the angel left her. This is the word of God. You may be seated as I pray for us this morning. Father in heaven, by a work of your spirit, afford us confidence this morning through an examination of your word to trust that Jesus is a sufficient Savior. Keep us from fanciful myths and Bring clarity to our understanding about how you have chosen to work and save a people for your glory. We ask this now of you in the standing of Christ. Amen. It can be the case that uh, talking about the virgin birth is awkward for some. Whether it's because sex, even from merely a biological perspective, was not talked about in your home growing up, or because there is a sense that sex just isn't something that should be mentioned in church, we might be okay with singing round yon virgin in silent night at Christmas time without ever really acknowledging what those words mean. 
But because God created sex both as the natural means for reproduction and the source of pleasure between a husband and a wife in the confines of marriage, the Bible, without awkwardness, without awkwardness, references sex simply as a matter of fact and very often warns against its misuse. And this is reflected in the early creeds of the church. Uh, concerning the Christian faith, a, a creed is a statement that defines right belief. We would say that somebody is orthodox in their faith because they have a right knowledge and are in agreement with the statement. Contrasting this, we would say that someone is unorthodox or even heretical if they don't believe the statement and instead believe something else. As it relates to the virgin birth, every major creedal statement includes it because the virgin birth does three things. One is it fulfills scripture. Two, it shows that Jesus was fully human. And three, it declares Jesus to be fully God. And it's within the confines of these three things that we know Jesus to be one who is sufficient, save. Well, how does the virgin birth fulfill scripture? Uh, to answer that, two main texts are appealed to. The first occurs way back in Genesis 3. That would be way back at the beginning of your Bible when God has a word which includes the first woman, Eve, after she and Adam had sinned against God by eating of the tree that they had been told not to eat from. You see, when those who had been created in perfect union with God ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, sin entered into the world. And the perfect relationship between God and man was broken. We're told that this is when death actually entered the world. And the whole of creation underwent a shift. Everything changed. Death, which results from sin, held sway and impacted every aspect of creation where life had once ruled. But despite the rebellion of those who had been created as very good and in the image of God, God declared that he would make a way for that relationship, which had once been perfect, to be restored. Knowing that men and women like, like you and, and I could not, would not, and will not live or think or speak or act according to God's holiness, God would not simply provide an external way to be right with him again. But instead, he would enter into our experience to restore the relationship that had been broken. In Genesis 3, God declares that one day the offspring of the woman would crush death and be victorious over sin. That through a woman, God would work to make things right. Now, fast forward to the days of the prophet Isaiah as he prophesied about God's Messiah. In Isaiah 7, 14, God's people are told that a deliverer will one day come and rescue them. They will once again know God's favor as God's Messiah frees them from their oppressor. Now, for those in Isaiah's day, just as it was for those in the days of Jesus, the thought was that the deliverance would be from the oppression of others, be it pagan nations around them or, or from Rome and where they were living. But ultimately, what God's Messiah would do is free them from the oppression of their own sin. And Isaiah prophesied that the freedom of God's people would happen in the following way. Listen as I read from Isaiah 7, 14. Here's the sign. It says this, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. See, the virgin will conceive, have a son, and his name will be Emmanuel. Now, clearly, being post-cross, we can draw a straight line from the prophecy in Isaiah to Mary and, jo and Jesus. But over the years, not everyone has been convinced. You see, the word that has been translated in Isaiah as virgin, which is in Hebrew, Alma, doesn't exclusively refer to a female who has never had sex, but more specifically to a young girl or an unmarried woman. Some have argued that because the word that can only mean virgin, is, which is Bethula, wasn't used. Maybe the New Testament writers incorrectly linked Isaiah with what was said about this miraculous birth account and they, that they would hope would maybe further their cause. After all, you might be surprised to hear that uh, the story of a virgin birth isn't unique to the Christian faith. In both ancient uh, Greek mythology and Egyptian mythology, there was promoted various kinds of birth accounts, virgin birth accounts, intended to give their God an edge in the day. 
But neither of these arguments hold because it's clear throughout Scripture, as well as writings outside of Scripture, that the word for young girl or unmarried woman that we see used in Isaiah culturally was synonymous with virginity. If you were an unmarried teenage girl, it was understood that you were a virgin. And if the gospel writers were looking to make a case for, for something miraculous, it makes zero sense to replicate the pagan stories of various half-animal and half-human creatures that would clearly have been understood as a myth into an orthodox Jewish context. And this is actually highlighted in Matthew's Gospel. Matthew's Gospel is the other one that gives us a birth narrative of Jesus. And it was written primarily for a Jewish audience and had that in mind. And it picks up on the importance of the virgin birth, not to create a superhero, but to fulfill Scripture. After all, the, the Jews were God's chosen people. They had God's revealed word. It spoke of a Messiah who would come and deliver them. So being able to clearly show how Jesus fulfilled those things in Scripture was essential. In the first chapter of Matthew's Gospel, Joseph has just learned that Mary, whom he was engaged to, was pregnant, and he knew the baby was not his. But the Scripture tells us that Joseph was a righteous man, and he planned to divorce her quietly so as not to bring disgrace on the woman that he loved. It says this in Matthew 1.20, having learned that Mary was pregnant, but after he had considered these things, speaking of Joseph, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now hear this. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet Isaiah. See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her, but did not have sexual relations with her until she gave birth to a son, and he named him Jesus. And so first, first, the virgin birth fulfills scripture that the Messiah would be born of a virgin. And in this fulfillment, the Savior would be fully human and fully God. This dual nature, human and divine, it can be confusing and it can be hard for us to understand. In theological terms, it's referred to as the, the hypostatic union. Now, there's a word that you can maybe impress somebody at a Christmas party later on uh, this month with, the hypostatic union. But how could Jesus be fully God and fully human? How this can be has always been a tricky thing for people to understand. And, and it's fair. I mean, infinite God and finite man becoming one has only ever happened once. And so it's not like we have other examples that we can go to for this. In, in fact, there were some in the early church, early in the first century, that from a philosophical perspective, they couldn't reconcile God the Son being fully human to iron out the wrinkles they saw in the hypostatic union, a line of thinking which came to be known as docetism was founded. Docetism, docetism is an ancient heresy that says Jesus was not fully human. According to docetism, Jesus only seemed human. But because Jesus was fully divine, he had no physical body. It was believed that the form uh, people saw was essentially a ghost. The early evidence that we see of this is actually in a response of John in those three short little letters we have near the back of our Bible. There, the Apostle John writes about a group who seemed to deny that Jesus came in the flesh, and it's important that he did. In 2 John 1, 7, he writes, I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is a deceiver and the Antichrist. Uh, Docetus focused on Jesus' divinity rather than his humanity. And until the church explicitly defined the relationship between the members of the Trinity at the Council of Nicaea in 325, Jesus' divine and human natures weren't held in common understanding by everyone in the church. Now, for the early church fathers, those were those the writers of the early church. The problem with Docetism was that if Jesus wasn't fully human, and this is important for us to understand today, then he couldn't really live. He couldn't really die. 
and he couldn't really be resurrected. If his body was an illusion, then so was the redemption that he offered. You see, the hope of the gospel and the salvation Christianity professes is completely based on Jesus' physical death and physical resurrection. You see, the Messiah needed to be human if he was going to be sufficient to save. But if Mary was a virgin, how could this be? One day when I was here at the, the church, someone stopped by to ask a question that had been on their mind for some time. I, I really love it when people do that. It's nice. It doesn't just break up my day, but it, it helps us think through things well. The question was this. Uh, understanding that the Holy Spirit was involved, was Mary's egg used to conceive God the Son in the flesh? It's a great question. It really is. It's a good question. And the theological implications of the answer act as a hook on which we hang our faith. And the answer is yes. In order for God the Son to be born a man, human conception needed to occur. When the Holy Spirit came upon the Virgin Mary, he used her natural reproductive system of ovulation to fertilize an egg and cause Mary to conceive a child. He was the man. Christ Jesus, the Son of God. The egg was the source of the human incarnation of Christ. Now, in the years that have followed, some have taken the virginity of Mary to an extent that is never spoken of, let alone even suggested in Scripture. The thinking is linked with uh, the belief that there is some spiritual purity in virginity. But this is wrong. Scripture never speaks of sex being worked out in the right context as something which is impure. After all, it would not have been a sin for, for Mary to have sexual relations with her husband, Joseph, but it actually would have been sinful for her to withhold herself from him throughout their marriage. And in a helpful way, Scripture actually just debunks this point altogether. If you think back to the passage that we read earlier in verse 24, it says, when Joseph woke up, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her, but did not have sexual relations with her until she gave birth to a son. So prior to the birth of Christ, no intercourse after the birth as the marital relationship allowed for it. We also know that Jesus had other brothers and sisters, albeit they half brothers and sisters, some of which are named in scripture and some of which we have no name for them. So any, name, any need to make Mary a virgin in perpetuity is something which attempts to put some special status on Mary and does so for some human end, not God's end. In fact, I would say that it actually takes away from the God-ordained union which occurs between a husband and a wife in a marriage through sex. There is no biblical or logical reason why Mary would have needed to remain a virgin following the birth of Christ. And being born of Mary, Jesus was fully human and would have had his mother's DNA. Jesus could only represent humans if he became a human, a real human. And if he could not have represented us, then he could not have redeemed us. As an aside, we don't often talk, uh, this topic doesn't really come up often uh, in our sermons or teachings in the church. So I think it might be helpful just as an aside to to pause for a moment, because uh, I think it can be helpful just to say that maybe you are one who thinks of sex or uh, has engaged in sex in some sinful way in your past. Uh, maybe you weren't a virgin when you got married. Uh, maybe you've done things or willingly had things done to you that are outside of God's intention for sex, which is to be a reflection of his love. And you might even be feeling, carrying these feelings of, of guilt or think of yourself as dirty or damaged because of that. But know that if you are in Christ, in this church, among this people, whatever your past, you are not branded with or forced to wear a scarlet letter. But instead, along with me and everyone else who has placed their faith in Christ, you are on equal footing as one who has been forgiven of your sin sin which is no more. Why? Because Jesus is a savior, one who is sufficient to save. Jesus had to be born as a human 
for several reasons. One is outlined in Galatians 4, uh, 4 to 5. Listen as I read that. It says, but when the time had fully come, God sent his son born of a woman under the law to redeem those under the law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. You see, only a man born under the law could redeem other humans being born under the same law. Born under the law of God, all humans are guilty of transgressing that law. Only a perfect human, Jesus, could perfectly keep the law and perfectly fulfill the law, thereby redeeming us of our guilt. And this is the third reason why the virgin birth matters. Being born of a virgin fulfilled the scripture. Yes, it satisfied that the Messiah would be fully human. And thirdly, being born of a virgin ensured that Jesus, being fully human, did not inherit the sin nature that you and I were born with. The sin nature that Mary, though a virgin, was born with. How is that? If Jesus was fully human, being born of Mary, and all people are born with a sin nature, how is that Jesus didn't inherit the same sin nature? Before we can answer that question, it's, it's important that we actually understand what the term original sin means. Uh, this is a term described to, uh, a term that's used to describe the effect of Adam's sin on all of his descendants. Remember back to the, the garden when Adam and Eve sinned against God by eating of the fruit they had been commanded not to eat? Now, let me ask you this. Were both Adam and Eve guilty? Yes. In fact, Eve was the first one who sinned, we would say. However, sin did not enter the world through Eve. It entered through Adam. Romans 5.12 actually tells us this. It says, therefore, just as one man, speaking of Adam, uh, just as through one man sin entered into the world, that's speaking, speaking of Adam, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. This means that in Adam, you and I sinned. The concept behind this is called federal headship. There's another term that you can uh, really impress someone at a Christmas party with later on. This means that a person, a father, represents his descendants and we see this concept actually worked out through Scripture. Now, to our modern-day sensibilities, it seems unfair that only one of the two between Adam and Eve should be blamed, and, and that it's Adam. After all, I mean, she sinned first, right? But that's what God does. And it's not because Eve was any less guilty, but because Adam was the one responsible. You see, as a part of God's ordered creation, God has established headship. And Adam was the first head, not just of his wife, but of all humanity. Now, this might be offensive to you and I as we think about things today, but it's just simply what Scripture teaches. And so when Adam disobeyed God, sin entered into the world, and human nature forever changed. From that moment onward, every son and daughter born would inherit a new depraved nature, a nature that, because of Adam's sin, needed a Savior. From the career criminal, the worst we could imagine, to the newborn baby that Nona just adored. We all need a Savior. Not only because we actually sin, but because in Adam we all have sinned. Now this might seem a little bit unfair. At least it did to my hearing when I first came across this. But this isn't like blaming all Caucasians today for the transatlantic slave trading sins of their forefathers or all men for systems which have historically sinfully oppressed women. No, this is saying that in Adam, each one of us individually, that's you and me, is to blame for the sin which required the Son of God to be crucified. You and I are guilty from conception and are in need of God's grace applied to us. You and I need one who is sufficient to save. You see that the sinful nature which originated with Adam is passed down from parent to child, and so we are by nature children of wrath. This is what Ephesians 2, 3 tells us. So if we inherit our, our sinful nature from, from our father, then Jesus, who had Mary as a parent, must have had a sin nature, right? Well, no, and here's why. There are some things in which God uses natural things to bring about supernatural realities. And in the case of our sin nature, God uses the seed of the man, without which no life can come, 
to transfer sin's curse from one generation to the next. All of us, every single one of us, are the product of a man's sperm and a woman's egg coming together, all of us. And as such, we are not born neutral. We are not born innocent. We are born under the curse, apart from God, and as such, we need one who is born under the law, but without sin, and who could fulfill the law to stand in our place. We need their righteousness attributed to us. And this is why the virgin birth is so important. Mary did not become pregnant by natural means. Adam's seed played no part. Instead, we're told in Luke 1, as we read before, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of Adam. No, that's not what it said. The, the one will be born will be called the Son of God. Since Jesus had no literal biological father, the sin nature was not passed down to him. However, since he had a human mother, he was fully human, but without original sin. Jesus had two natures, right? God and man. Uh, Colossians 2.9 says, For in him, speaking of Jesus, dwells the fullness of deity in bodily form. Jesus received his human nature from Mary, but his divine nature was maintained through God the Holy Spirit. Jesus was sinless. He had no original sin and was both fully God and fully man. And this can only happen through the virgin birth. Now, please note that the scriptures completely reject any notion that the sinlessness of Christ had anything to do with Mary being conceived sinless herself or living a life that was sinless. Various teachings surrounding the immaculate conception would assert this, but they're just not true. No, unlike you and I who are by nature sinful from birth, Jesus did not inherit a sin nature because he was not born of man, but of woman. Who God in Genesis 3 says will have an offspring that will crush the head of the serpent, will defeat sin. Now, a sermon like this today can be a little more teachy than preachy. It can feel a little bit heady uh, to us, come across maybe as a bit academic. But the truth is that being, all, all the truths that are being declared in the virgin birth are in no way something that we can choose to disagree on like we might some other aspects of faith or practice. And so the question for you here today is, have you placed your faith in the Christ that God has offered you or have you placed your faith in some other Christ? If so, if you have placed your faith in some other Christ, it would be unloving for me to fail to tell you that believing that the virgin birth is a myth, by definition, rejects the Christ who was sent to save. For if not born of a virgin, then your Christ does not fulfill God's promise to his people. It strips Jesus of his humanity or robs him of his divinity by staining him with the very sin which has separated you and me from God from birth. Any sacrifice of Jesus apart from the virgin birth is rendered insufficient. And if this is the case for you, then in light of God's word, the call to you is, as the Apostles' Creed states, believe in the virgin birth and place your faith in Christ today. Now, if you're one who has accepted the virgin birth, though miraculous and in ways just really hard to understand, be encouraged that today your faith is rooted in the fulfillment of God's word, in the humanity and the divinity of Jesus who stood in your place. And in this, when wrapped up all together, all these things we know really is the most amazing Christmas gift ever, a Christ who is sufficient to save. Do you join me as I pray? Father, we thank you for the way that you have worked in history to save us, for sending God the Son to be born of a virgin so that we could have one who is sufficient to save. Cause our hearts to have confidence in this today. For your glory, we pray. Amen.